I'm going to talk about what's happening in the data center, what's happening in high performance computing. I'm going to talk very little about silicon photonics till the end. But I want people to understand, and there's a panel afterwards where you'll get different talks, what's happening with data, what's driving this enormous amount of bandwidth demand. And over the next couple of years, you're going to see this big surge in photonic opportunity. But that opportunity is really driven by cost. And how do you scale both bandwidth, density, power, to volumes and cost structures that will be replicable in this? Is there a, oh, OK. So I'll talk about some trends. And then I'll specifically look at a deep dive um, into the data center, HPC, and then consumer. All right, for some of those who are in this space, maybe a little high level, uh, but I, just trying to give everyone a, a perspective of what's actually happening and digging into what's happening in the cloud. I'll then talk about, tie that to what's happening from a, what we care about, what's happening to the compute world. And we'll call it now the compute is the rack. It's no longer a server. And then I'll sort of put it all together and just have a foil on what we've done. So a couple of foils, data explosion, right? No matter how you slice this, there's an enormous amount of data that's being generated, an enormous amount of data that's being collected and aggregated. And these are just a couple of quotes. This is from IBM. You know, every day we create 2.5 quintillion bytes of data, right? And if you think about that, so much that 90% of the world's data today has been created in the last two years alone. And if you fast forward a year from now, it'll be more data is collected in the last year than the last. I mean, so it, this is an exponential times an exponential amount of data. And for those who have kids, and if, you, if I know just the stuff that my kids put on YouTube, someone has to manage that. Someone has to store that. It doesn't generate a lot of money. But it's enormous amount. 100 hours of video are uploaded every minute. That was six months ago. And I don't have any new data, but I, I don't think it's less. Um, let's look at connected devices. And this sort of ties to the mobile, Internet of Things, mobile devices and how they relate back to a data center. And let's look at a couple of this. So smartphones, everyone has a phone, everyone's connected. For every 400 devices, there's a server that has to be put somewhere to take that data that goes up to the cloud and manage that information. For every wearable devices, if we look at the medical space, for every 100 of those devices, there's a server that has to manage that. And this is the surprising piece. If you look at connected devices in the factory, these are all these things that are measuring the machines, the air conditioners, right? We have a lot of these devices that are just monitoring things. For every 40 of those, there's a server. And digital signs, which is something that's coming, right? These are these signs in the airport. These are kiosks, right? It's a combination of not only is that uh, displays, but there's intelligence behind that display. For every 20 of those, there's a server. And so you have all these connected devices that where they operate on Wi-Fi, WiMAX, LTE, they all go back up to the cloud. And what that leads to is what's happen what does that data do? And it leads to what we'll call big data. Right? This is a term, right? Everyone calls it big data or the cloud. But what's happening is these data centers are getting bigger, right? The data is growing exponentially, they just talked about. We're developing faster. CPUs, but those CPUs are now multi-core, right? We're eight cores, 16 cores. There's some high-end uh, CPUs for the HPC market that will have much more than 50, 60 cores. Because all these cores now can operate independently through virtualization, and you can multitask those cores. And on top of that, due to virtualization, you can move that information around. And so on the East Coast, after 5 o'clock, people on the West Coast send their data that has to be analyzed and can operate in the evening where the, those data centers are not operating. So you don't have to have the data in one location, but you have to get access to that data. As these things get bigger, as you have more distribution of data, the size of these data centers are getting phenomenally huge. Right? We're calling mega data centers. The picture at the top is the top view, and I'm going to go into more detail, of a data center that no one's ever heard of. QTS, it's in Atlanta, it's a million square feet. All right, just to put in context, the, the one below 
I always like to put that one, it's a secret but not so secret data center anymore from our friends at the, the NSA, roughly a million square feet. There's a data center being built in China. It will be the largest data center, 2016, five million square feet, All right? And I, I have it in backup, I can't remember the name right now. So longer, bigger data centers, you have to distrib distribute this information, you have to put all this information, which then leads to more connectivity. And you know, the picture on the right is just, the, that's not what they really look like. I just, someone found this picture. Um, you have to connect all these things together, right? And not only do you have to connect in rack, you have to connect across rack, you have to connect across row. And the amount of cabling and the amount of connectorization is going up. At the same time, the data rates for those connectors are also going up, right? So we're gonna be moving from 10 gig to 25 gig, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So the three of these lead to an explosion, a limitation of what can copper do, or the benefits of, of photonics, simply airflow alone, removing the cabling, if you can remove the airflow, will provide value um, if you can do it cost effectively. So big data, big data centers, lots of computers, and now you have to connect them together. So let's take a closer look at the data center. So this is the, a, a zoom in on QTS. Uh, again, it's the fifth largest data center that probably no one's heard of. If you look at the top five, by the way, I think it'll change in the next two years. Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Amazon are not in the top five, All right? They have a lot of data centers, but there are actually smaller building blocks that are going into. Um, and maybe over time this becomes the, the muscle thing where they'll be building these MAGA data centers just to say you're the, you're the largest. But, um, so let's zoom in on this so you get a sense of the size. The yellow bars are where the long trunks are run and then all the cabling comes down to the rack. So let's zoom in on one of these racks, right? And this is where from an you know, Intel perspective or an industry perspective this is where we've been focusing on and we're taking it out. So let's look at a rack today. You have a rack with distributed computing, distributed memory, right? There's a rack and all those cablings up, these links, we'll call them uplinks, one gig, moving to 10 gig, moving to 40 gig, all go up to a TOR, top of the rack switch, right? Typically PCI Express up, all those links go up, roughly three meters, right? The three meters is a number that you'll see this magic thing that people talk about three meters, below three meters, above three meters, because that's roughly the size of a rack, okay? Volume, let's just say there's 100,000 units. I'll use this in terms of relativeness when I, as we go up. So then what happens? There's typically then a row, these racks are put into rows. And there's typically 10 to 20 racks in a row. That number, depending on who you talk to, some people have it 10, some people have 12, some people have 16. And that's their cookie cutter. They lay these out rectangularly, and so that's this, there's no magic number, but the, each customer has this box, this number. Those then from the tour go up to a leaf, right? So leaf is an aggregation. Those links today on the left is the reach, typically 20 to 300 meters. On the right gives you a, a sense of the volume, right? It's an order of magnitude less volumes in terms of links. Those are optical today at 40 gig. Right, because if you look at copper, maybe seven, 10 meters. Um, those leafs then get aggregated to spine switches. So these spine switches are multi-million dollars, big aggregation switches. These are now, we're talking, you know, up to two kilometers. You know, typically one to two kilometers, 500 meters and above. Costs of those are two orders of magnitude, but again, an, roughly another order of magnitude less, right? Those are already 100 gig today, 40 gig moving to 100, predominantly all single mode. And then we go up from the leaf to the spine to the core. And the core is what we'll say, these are these massive, you know, within a data center, there's maybe two or four of these that go out to the outside world, right? The, this we'll, we'll call it, you know, from our view, we'll call it telecom. It's outside the data center. Those are already 100 gig today. They're typically DWDM. Typically, these mega data centers are situated somewhere near where power is, because these, these data centers are 20 to 30 kilowatts, or megawatts, sorry, per building, per size, and they're also located near a railroad, 
Anybody know why they're located near railroads? Because fiber across the country, that's why I found out when I visited them, turns out along the railroad is where a lot of the fiber has been planted from the long haul, okay? So again, those are very expensive boxes, but the volume's again another order of magnitude. And, and I, I'm throwing the volume because when you look at um, an opportunity that's volume-centric, right, from our perspective, the volume's way down at the bottom. And, the, and you'll see here. So then the question is, um, it's very cost sensitive. And then the question is, as you move to shorter distances, while the volumes go up, the cost becomes more critical. And the question is, can you have a common technology that you can take across as much of that as possible versus having a different technology for every different reach? Because if you do, then you have to have a different uh, architecture, different technology, and you lose your, your potential cost opportunity. The second thing is, and I think I talked about that, everything else also moving to 100 gig. So you'll see this big move coming. The top of the rack switches are going to 2400 gig, right? At the end of this year, ramping to 16. And also that means that the in-rack connectivity will move to multiples, I call it M by 25. If you have 100 gig going out in the rack, the push will be some multiple that one or two by 25 down to each tray or down to each server. Okay, so that gives you a sense of what's happening in the data center. Mega data centers, big connectivity, everything moving to 100 gigabits per second, or M by 25. At 25 gig, you start seeing an inflection point, potentially, of copper. Now, like anything with Moore's Law continues, and over the last couple of weeks, you start seeing a lot of people who are demonstrating 25, 30, 50 gig on copper. And again, it's always this trade-off of, where does the optical crossover point? Can you be cost effective enough um, for cabling, for optical versus copper? And that leads to, I'll talk about later, the whole solution. Let's jump to high performance computing, just to give you the other end of the spectrum, and then I'll do a few foils on the consumer. This is, uh, and I was trying to get a new one, but I didn't get it approved uh, by legal. So this is a 2013 system. It was the number one system from high performance computing. Um, just to give you an idea, it was 50 petaflop, or 50, actually 55, peak performance. It had 32,000 Xeon processors in a cluster, 48,000 Xeon Phi's in a cluster. That one system, this is a high performance computing build, 17 kilowatts, 17,000 kilowatts. I don't know why they wrote it like that, but it's basically 17 megawatts. All right, just one system that consumed the building. So let's look a little closer there, right? This is the, an IBM supercomputer. I'm trying to, I tried to pick things that share the wealth um, so I don't get focused on one. Just to give you an idea, the big problem in HPC is cabling. Can you imagine connecting that up? One of the biggest things is, is the copper connectivity and the cabling is immense. They have to put those things on risers because the weight of the cabling alone. This is outside. Let's take a closer look inside the rack. What's actually in a rack? You typically have a node or some multi-socket CPU. Those are then connected to some switch. Typically, there's 32 nodes in a rack, and that 32 nodes leads to a 64-point port switch. Every node connects to a switch, and then within the, within the rack, every node talks to every other node. So you have 32 nodes, and each node talks to each other nodes. I think that's the next build. Then those nodes each talk to each other, half of them, and the other half goes out. So these are three meter cables typically, right? This is the rack size. So you can imagine the, the nest or the spider web of connectivity and cables inside that system. You then look at what is a real HPC system. Every rack is connected fully meshed to every other rack which is connected to every other node. So you have this octopus of cabling and connectivity. Those distances there between, a, if you look at a system, they usually talk about the maximum length. Typically, on average, they're 50 meters, maybe moving to 70 as they're getting bigger. Um, maximum 100 meters. But it's, an, it's a nest of cabling. Today, it's already optical at 10 to 40. And as the, as the industry moves to 25 gig signaling, this will also move to 25 gig signaling, 
and you're starting to question, does the inside the rack replace, does the optical replace copper if it adds simplicity at a price effective cost point? So, oh, I forgot I added this. So roughly, if you look at HPC system today, 30% roughly of the cost is in the cabling and the I.O. Right? And that continues to go up. So when someone builds a system, they build a $300 million HPC system, they already ag allocate $100 million for the I.O. and it's actually becoming a little high. The ability, it also then limits what the size and the performance of the system is because you're already spending a lot of that money on the cabling. So the benefits of photonics here is the flexibility, removes the density constraints, and what, I, what we hear from customers is the serviceability. Simpler cabling, being able to plug these things in, although you can do copper, it might be cheaper. The, 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 the nuances of very sensitive cables, being able to connect them together, backplane connectivity starts to be a little uh, finicky. And so is there an opportunity to simplify it? And let alone just getting rid of the copper, the, the spider web nest for airflow. That alone adds more value for these systems that consume an enormous amount of power. So that's the HPC. I talked about the data center. Trend is the same. Massive size, massive connectivity. Let's take the other extreme real quick on the consumer side. Although this is farther out, but again, I think you'll see similar trends. Here's what's happening with displays. Um, I think the 3D uh, opportunities changed or morphed, and now it's all about 4K and then quickly move into 8K, right? So I think Apple's already has a 4K display as part of their system. If you look at what happened at CES, it's all about 4K. 4K is coming, movies are coming in 4K, and this is a simple plot uh, that's 60 gigahertz and 120 hertz. Let's look at the 120, and I had a 240. Um, but 4K displays, this is the raw bandwidth needed to feed the display. Right? Assuming no compression, assuming anything. So if you look at, at, at 120 hertz today, you're looking at roughly 50 gigabits of raw bandwidth that's needed to get to a display. Now the other thing you have to remember is that 4K displays also aren't getting smaller, they're getting bigger. So you have to bring that data into the display, but then you have to move that data across a much larger screen. Uh, and if you move to 8K, which is also, they're already talking about the next generation, you're now talking real-time bandwidth of about 200 gigabits, right? 200 gigabits per second, just to refresh real-time a display. And so, just to put it into context, let's overlay that with what copper signaling does today in the consumer space, right? USB 2, which a lot of people still have, 200 megabits. We're moving to USB 3, which is now the standard. That's five gigabits per second. And there's a USB 3 super speed, uh, I, I think that's so it's called, that's looking at 10 gigabits per second. Thunderbolt, which has come out at 10 gigabits per second and is moving to 20 gigabits per second in the next year. So just to put it in perspective, the data rates I've showed you are an order of magnitude faster the need than any of the copper connectivity we have today, right? So it's not just bandwidth. The other thing you have to understand is these displays are also getting extremely thin. So if you can see on the picture on the left, you see the, the, this is uh, from 2012, just to put it in perspective. The edge of that where her finger's pointing is the thickness of that display. Uh, in this case, they have all the connectivity on the bar on the other side. But that display uh, was four millimeters thick. You know, just a comparison, iPhone 5, and again, I, I just pulled these. Um, you know, if you have an iPhone 5, that's 7.6 millimeters th thick. There's new iPads, and we, just, we, we ourselves launched a, a, a reference design for these new tablets that are roughly seven millimeters. So it's not only bandwidth, but how do you actually transmit that information across a 55, 60 inch screen, right? Where copper cabling, just from an industrial design perspective, becomes very cumbersome, okay? 
So these are three trends, right, from the big data and the data center, right, that move information. High performance computing takes that to another level, right, in terms of bandwidth and in terms of massive amounts of connectivity. And then if you go to the, the consumer side, which is even more sensitive to cost with enormous volume, there are demands that are asking for thin, light, high bandwidth connectivity, right? All these we look at as opportunities of where integrated photonics or photonics in general can add value. So let's look at the, I'll call it the evolution, and I kind of talked about this, but you have to understand this has evolved over years, right? You had a desktop, you had a server that sat on your desk. That's now been integrated to racks of servers. Those racks are now come to what we'll call a converged rack. Right, the converged rack has you know, common power supplies, common power bays, common memory bays. But this is now the new compute node in a data center. Right? Data centers talk about installing racks as the, what, they, what, what they install with. They don't talk about CPUs anymore. They don't talk about servers. They talk about how many racks they're putting in. And they build at that level. Right? So for every rack, you know, there's a tour. For every rack, you know how many memory pools are. And so let's look at the evolution of what's happening in the data center. I'll call today, we'll call physical aggregation. You know, this is the, the metal sheet power supplies. We've stripped away a lot of redundancy, or the industry has. All right, you don't need a fan. When you don't think about it as a server anymore, you don't need a, every blade or every server has its own power supply, has its own fan. You don't need that anymore. You, you actually start sharing it. So every bank of five servers or every bank of five trays will share a power supply. Every bank of five will share a, a common fan infrastructure. So you actually end up baking, banking these, and you strip away a lot of redundancy, right, which is, lowers the overall cost. The next phase is we'll start this modularization or disaggregation, where you start separating compute and storage and I.O., and then memory, eventually. So the first phase is we're already starting this. Right? We call it a rack scale architecture. Other people call it modular compute. Every, other people call it disaggregation, where you start putting in banks of memory or separating the I.O., storage, and networking. So you actually start, you can upgrade these things at different rates, and you don't have to have everything on a board. As we start moving forward, and this is a place where and I'll show you later where photonics starts to have some interesting play. And remember, photonics, at the end of the day, customers will decide. Some customers care about, at the end of the day, it's their TCO. So are they willing to pay a little more for the photonics because it buys them something? Or they, will they stay with the lower cost solution and live with the nuances of the, the cabling and infrastructure? And this all depends on different customers have different uh, perspectives on that. But as, as you start down this path, you start moving to complete aggregation or disaggregation of separating pooled resources. So you can ma imagine now having a bank of memory or a bank of storage that's sitting at a different rack. And all the CPUs are in one rack. And then you have another rack of, of memory and another rack of pooled storage. So as you move into this big data, as you move into these Hadoop clusters, as you move into these massive algorithms of big data and health, having access to lots of memory where you can store all this information, very powerful, but you can't put that in electrically, right? So the, the potential opportunity here for photonics is not about bandwidth. It's just buying you two, three, four meters of capability and density that you can't buy with a massive amounts of aggregation through copper. And so what's needed, you know, when you look at the future data center, and this evolves over time, right? This is when you do these big transitions, one, you realize there's a lot of ecosystem that you have to build in. There's early adopters that will take the leading edge technology. And then there's the mass market, which comes later, right? But when you put it together, you need, and I'll talk about why. I call it integrated, scalable photonics. Obviously, we think it's silicon photonics. And I'll explain why you need that. Because if you don't have a scalable solution, and I think this is where integration helps, a linear approach of putting discrete components down when you move up in bandwidth becomes very difficult because it's a linear cost piece. 
you need this low cost, right? And everyone says, what's the magic number? Well, it depends, right? It's never cheap enough, but you need to, you know, there's orders of magnitude of what's there today, and it'll never be, just to put it in perspective, when we talk on a, on a server, and you talk about IO connectivity in copper, they talk about it, our architects talk about it in terms of pennies per pin, just to put it into perspective, right? So here we're talking dollars or multi-dollars or tens of dollars per gigabit, right? At the board level, it's dollar pennies per pin, right? So there's, there's a big, quite a big separation, which also means you're not going to do that all at once, right? You have to find where those opportunities are. That leads to the high volume server friendly packaging. I also think over time it'll move away from pluggables to embedded because you want to start putting optics on the board. And that moves to a whole different model. You have to have the photonics reliable enough that you can put it down onto a board, but then you can start co-packaging it with your ICs. All this then leads to a ability to have new architectures, all right? The ability to have things separatable, the, the ability to have connectivity allows people to design new systems, new architectures that they couldn't do constrained with a limitation of I can only do this two meters or I can only do this six inches, right? And those are things that evolve over time when you have the technology, you can start designing with new architectures, right? And so when you look at that, and I, I've used this cartoon probably for five, six years, um, but I'm just trying to give you a perspective of what integration buys you. And let's just say we start off at 100 gig, right? And let's just say it's 4 by 25, and this is, you know, technology we have where you have integrated lasers, modulators, a MUX, right? So you can take advantage of, of integration. And let's say you start off at 4 by 25, right? There's nothing magical about 4. There's nothing magical about 25. The next speed bump, right? People are quickly talking about 50 or 56 gig. And we use 25 and 28 interchangeably. Um, so I can take the same thing and I just dr change the driver or I go to some maybe PAM4, there's a lot of interest in that. I can now get 4 by 50, that's 200 gig. There's nothing magical when you look at integration about 4. You can do 8, you can do 16. 8 by 25, right, where I integrate more components together but it's the same piece of silicon. Incremental cost, right? It's, it's sort of this is the value of integration. You're putting more components down but that cost isn't twice as much. And then if I take it to the extreme, right, just from a cartoon perspective, we call this scale up and scale out. Scale up in bandwidth, scale out in number of channels. And let's say I do 50, 25 channels with, at 50 gigabits per second, that's 1.25 terabits. Same architecture, same fundamental solution, packaging. And why that's interesting is when you look at those aggregate bandwidths, you have a solution that can scale for the data center over time. You have a solution that starts at the high-performance computing. A high-performance computing today will take multiple terabits of I.O. and they'll consume it all and they'll, they'll ask for more. And then if you have this as a core technology, you can then eventually drop it into the consumer market over time. So, and this is the last flow I put, putting it all together, right? This is what we've been working on, right? We've been starting to work at the rack level out. And how do you bring these technologies together this is Diane Bryan, who runs our data center group. This is a, a rack that we've demoed at IDF, but it's a fully integrated rack. We call it rack scale architecture. This is our, our terminology. But it's a rack that has photonics built onto the board. It has switch silicon. It has MXE cables and connectors, which we've worked with Corning. And there's five other cables and connectors that we're trying to bring out to the industry and try to develop the ecosystem it's not silicon photonics based, it's just a common connector. People can put any kind of fiber on it, but it's scalable, right? It can go 100 gig, 400 gig, up to a terabit at 64 fibers. And all that together is bringing us a new architecture where now when you look at that rack, there are no cables, right? There's a little fiber on the side. All the cabling is up along the inside of the rack, right? And that adds value to the customer because it opens up the system, it opens the airflow, but also it starts thinking about racks as a compute node. It's not just one rack anymore. Maybe you can connect now four together because you're not constrained by distance. And so hopefully this gives you a different perspective of what's happening. And it's the last foil. I'm going to take some questions. Um, 
I call it a transformation is happening, driven at the beginning by mobile data connectivity, connected to the cloud, which is driving to enormous amount of large data centers or mega data centers, which need more connectivity, connected to higher bandwidth, moving from 10 gig to 25 gig to 50 gig, which puts constraints on copper, and then also the need for a scalable, integratable solution. And it's not just the photonics, right? You have to look at the whole solution. How do you deliver a solution that's the, the devices, the packaging, the cable, the connectors, and all that works together uh, with architectures. And so, you know, we're also, um, I, I put here lots of innovation of a, ahead, but we're just at the beginning, right? Everyone's excited about 100 gig. People are just sampling that market's just starting to grow. But the irony is, even nine months ago, a lot of people didn't think 100 gig was real. Those so, the same people who now have tipped, right, because they see 100 gig is coming, it's starting to become cost effective, they're already asking for 400 gig. And, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting from, from our side how fast that can move, right? The industry hasn't even launched 100 gig, and customers are saying it's not enough because they've accepted that 100 gig is coming, and they're already saying, oh, here's what I could do, and how do I get to 400 gig? How do I get to multiple terabits on a rack of I.O. connectivity because the bandwidth demand is there? So, you know, from a photonics perspective, for a lot of us who've been in this industry, it's a very exciting time because I think we're just at the beginning of, of bringing broadly photonics out uh, to the mass market and to the industry, right? And this is, it starts at the data center, starts at high-performance computing, but that technology then will waterfall down uh, across the, the, the consumer space and then into other areas of bio and health. And so I think it's a, it's a really exciting time. Everyone's always talked about it. It's almost here, it's almost here, but it's really here now. And I think 15 becomes this transitional year, and then it starts in the second half of the, of the I guess, this decade. So... So with that, hopefully it's a different type of talk. I know Peter, I sent him the foils from a different talk I gave, and he said, oh, could you give this? Hopefully this was very useful to give people a perspective of what's happening from you know, the server side and looking at the compute side out as opposed to just looking at photonics and technologies. Okay? Thank you. Is it time for questions? Or